the uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds on the week. It is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. John Arthur to give us a presentation on member <clears throat> membranous nephropathy. John Arthur uh, is remarkably young looking since he joined our faculty last century and uh, in the laboratory of Dr. John Klein where he learned about proteomics and was in such demand that the uh, University of South Medical College of South Carolina stole him from us after about five or six years here where he progressed to the rank of professor, professor of medicine. After serving time in South Carolina Below the Mason-Dixon line, he moved to the west to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, where he is now the chief of the nephrology division there. And it is my pleasure to have him give us a talk on the pathophysiology and causative factors of membranous nephrology, that membranous <coughs> nephritis. Thank you, John, and proceed, please. All right, thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I, uh, I have very warm memories of, uh, of Louisville in particular because of the uh, very welcoming and outstanding faculty that, uh, that were there and it, it was a wonderful start to my academic career. So um, there have been a lot of advances um, recently in the area of membranous nephropathy and really it gave me cause to go back and think about sort of the history of membranous nephropathy. So this is kind of going to be both a look back as well as a look forward at, uh, at the area of membranous nephropathy. And I'll give you just a minute to look at this word cloud, which has got uh, a lot of the things that, uh, that uh, you'll be, we'll be talking about during this talk. And, uh, and hopefully this will mean a little bit more to you at the end of this. Um, in terms of disclosure, um, I am on an advisory board for Trevere Therapeutics. Um, nothing about that will be related to this talk and uh, have some NIH grants also unrelated. Um, so what we want to talk about today um, related to membranous nephropathy is the histological findings. Um, I, I think this is kind of cool, the three different ways that antibodies can cause membranous nephropathy. I think that's something that people don't think about too much. And, and I, I want to kind of stress that as I go through. And then uh, describe the role of antibodies against PLA2R in membranous nephropathy. And we'll talk a little bit about some newer um, antibodies as well. So starting with a case presentation, um, our case is a 64-year-old white male. Um, he presents with edema really over his whole body, uh, generalized fatigue, and a complaint of frothy urine. Um, he says the, the, the edema started about six weeks prior and has gotten progressively worse, but other than that um, and the, the symptoms up above, he doesn't really have anything else to complain about. His only past medical history is hypertension and he's taking hydrochlorothiazide for that. Um, he doesn't have any history of diabetes, hepatitis, cancer, and has had an unremarkable uh, colonoscopy recently. On physical exam, the first thing that jumps out at you is his really generalized edema. Um, including even periorbital edema of the face. His blood pressure is a little high and the exam is otherwise unremarkable. And so these are some of the findings that you might see. This is a Netter diagram of somebody with periorbital edema um, over on the left. Um, and then here you can see this very impressive pitting edema here where you push your finger in and, uh, and the dent stays. And here's his, uh, his frothy urine. And we get some labs, and really, for the most part, initially, it's, it's not too remarkable. His hemoglobin is maybe a little bit low. His creatinine is normal at 0.9, and his BUN is 19. His potassium's okay. Um, the rest of his electrolyte panel looks uh, pretty good. Um, you note when you get his blood, and probably you, you might see his serum albumin back before you see anything from the urinalysis, that, uh, that his serum albumin is pretty low at 2.1. Um, you get a lipid panel, and he's got uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, um, and you get a urinalysis, and the protein comes back as, uh, as very positive on the dipstick, um, but there's no blood cells seen when they look at it under microscopy, and the, the system tells you that there's a few hyaline casts, and we'll look at another example of that uh, in a minute. 
but you get that 24-hour urine protein collection, and he's got 8.4 grams. So here's somebody with uh, with edema, um, with uh, with proteinuria, um, a low serum albumin, high, uh, hyper uh, cholesterolemia, and uh, so you're you're thinking that there's something going on with his kidney. You actually, like a good nephrologist, you spin his urine. And you see all of these, uh, un under light microscopy, you see these different sized uh, 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 particles in, in the urine. And then you polarize it, and you actually see that there are Maltese crosses on, on the urine. So the, uh, th those are likely lipid droplets in the, uh, in the urine, or they're also associated with nephrotic syndrome. So, so this is a classic case of nephrotic syndrome. He's got greater than three and a half grams of proteinuria on his 24-hour collection. His albumin is low. Um, he's got edema. He's got hyperlipidemia. Um, we didn't talk about being hypercoagulable, but he certainly is at risk for that. So, um, so the next thing you do is think about, well, what, what could this be? Um, something with a lot of proteinuria, and some of the things that might come to the top of your differential diagnosis are, if he had diabetes, that would be the most common cause of this, but we know that he doesn't have uh, diabetes. Um, if, it's a, um, if it is a, a primary glomerular disease, FSGS might be the more, most likely thing, but you're certainly thinking about membranous nephropathy, you're thinking about minimal change disease, and probably your, your differential is, uh, is longer than this, but this is going to be some of the most likely things that you're going to see. And this is from a renal biopsy series in Springfield, Massachusetts, back in the early 1990s. Um, and they looked at 300, a little over 300 consecutive renal biopsies and, uh, and looked at to see what the, the most common causes were. And in that series, and in several other series, FSGS is the most common cause for a, uh, for a nephrotic syndrome for people that are getting biopsy. And membranous is shortly after that. Minimal change nephropathy is after that. And in this series, diabetic nephropathy um, was fourth. But that is uh, biased by the fact that we don't often biopsy people with, di with diabetes. Oftentimes, if we, somebody presents like this with diabetes, we're not necessarily going to do a biopsy because we uh, assume that it might be diabetes. That thought process is changing some, I think, now, but, um, but certainly is, is still largely the case. So you go ahead and get a kidney biopsy. And, um, and I've, I'm going to show, I'm going to jump right to the silver stain because that's got some of the nice findings. So over on the left here is a, uh, is a normal kidney biopsy. And since this is a silver stain, we're largely staining, the, the, all of the dark staining is glomerular basement membranes. And then the pink and the blue are counter stains just to sort of make it show up where things are. But the things that have got, um, that, that stain with the silver, you can see that, the, uh, that, that there's a lot of it in the, um, uh, in the capillary loops. You can see that there's, um, that there's GBM staining with silver around the outside of Bowman's capsule, and then also at the bases of the, um, uh, of the, of the tubule cells as well. So that's where it is. But in this, in this normal kidney, you can see that the, um, that the uh, glomerular basement membrane staining with the silver is smooth, and, uh, and the capillary loops are open and hopefully kind of wispy. This, this actually seems like a little bit of a dark silver stain, but, but everything looks open and pretty much normal. In contrast, what you might see in membranous nephropathy is that these capillary loops, they're all kind of ratty looking, and they have these spikes sticking up, and they've got these holes in the glomerular basement membrane, and you can really see that throughout the whole area. This is, this is a really good example of these spikes that you might see on, uh, on membranous nephropathy. And when you get the electron microscopy, over here on the left is a normal electron microscopy, uh, mi microscope image, and so this is the urinary space where the everything is going to end up. Inside here is a um, is the this is the capillary loop. You can see we've actually captured a platelet in here, and you can see endothelial cells. You can see the glomerular basement membrane, and you can even make out three layers of the glomerular basement membrane across here. So the endothelial um, cell layer, the glomerular basement membrane itself. And then these nice little soldiers standing up all along here. These are um, 
processes of the epithelial cells that line the uh, that, that line the the uh, the top of the glomerular basement membrane, and uh, and so these are podocyte foot processes is what they call these, and they're nicely spaced out. If you look really closely, I don't know if you can see, but in between here, you can even make out this wispy little connection in between these podocyte foot processes. So this is a normal um, th this is a normal glomerular basement membrane of what a normal kidney should look like. Um, in contrast, here's another one. So again, it's oriented in pretty much the same way. We've got the urinary space over here. Um, we've got the uh, the capillary lumen over here. Um, the uh, this is the um, uh, the glomerular basement membrane. And unlike over here, now this is zoomed in more, so it's kind of hard to to compare them. But oh, unlike over in this one, where it's uh, really nice and continuous and it all looks the same, these have got these dark, dense areas in here, which are deposits. And so those are things that shouldn't be here. We've got normal um, uh, glomerular base membrane, membrane here, but we've got these dense deposits, or I shouldn't use the word dense. We've got deposits um, inside here. And then the foot processes, there's really no nice organization like we have over here in the, uh, in the normal one. You can actually see this epithelial cell kind of spread out here, but it, this definitely looks abnormal. And it's these deposits that we're, gonna, um, that we're gonna focus on. And then you do the immunofluorescence. Um, the, uh, and, and on immunofluorescence, you can see this is for, um, for IgG. And you can see that there's this, uh, the, there's something lining the capsule, so they're, they're lining the uh, glomerular basement membrane. So there's um, deposits of immunoglobulin, and if we got C3, that would probably also be uh, be positive. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what normally prevents proteinuria. So this is a diagram of um, of a single glomerulus with the afferent arterial coming in and the efferent arterial going out. The blood comes and circulates through these uh, capillaries inside here and then, uh, and then exits at the, uh, at the efferent arterial. You've got uh, a, a group of mesangial cells sort of in the middle of, the, um, of, of these loops. And then we'll zoom in a little bit more here um, into this area and, uh, and you can see it a little bit better. Uh, and, and here we're starting to zoom in even more. So here is the, uh, a, a single glomerular capillary loop, and you can see that there's the endothelial cells along here, but it doesn't, it doesn't make a continuous border. There's actually fenestrations in these endothelial cell lining of this. And here's the glomerular basement membrane and these podocyte foot processes. And now we're gonna zoom in even a little bit more. And so here we are kind of all the way zoomed in, and now we can even see that at these, along these, um, these endothelial cells here and the, um, the, uh, at the fenestrations, there's actually this fine matrix of stuff, which is called glycocalyx. So here is the initial barrier to filtration, but it's really not a very good barrier. The, these holes are really pretty big. Lots of stuff can get through the first level. And then you've got the glomerular basement membrane itself. And so this is made up of, of a number of different proteins, um, largely collagens, type four collagens, um, but a bunch of other proteins too, laminins, uh, agrins, um, a, a bunch of other proteins in here that are negatively charged. So now there's this matrix of proteins that anything that first makes it through this, um, the fenestrations and the endothelial cells has to make it through this next barrier. And then finally it gets out here and it comes out um, underneath the podocytes. And here's the podocyte foot processes. And here's, I pointed out that tiny little um, line that you could kind of see in between there. That's what this is here. And this is actually um, proteins called nephrin and there's another protein called NEF1 that kind of stick their arms out. They're inside the cell and they stick their arms out and they make connections between these, these podocyte foot processes. And this is the final um, size barrier in terms of um, keeping things from getting through the glomerular basement membrane. So, so that's kind of what, what normally stops us all from having this proteinuria um, that would be life-threatening if, uh, if we didn't have this nice barrier to be able to keep the proteins from, um, from being lost in the urine. 
So now I'm going to go back a little bit in the history of, um, of nephrology and talk about the um, identification of the antigen for something called Heyman nephritis. And so this, uh, these were studies that were done in the early 1960s by Walter Heyman and his colleagues. And what they did is they wanted to, um, I don't know how they came up with this idea in the first place, but they, they, um, they, they got a kidney, they ground up the kidney, and then they inject it into um, uh, a rat. And the rat ev eventually develops proteinuria. And so they were trying to figure out what is it that causes this proteinuria. And um, what they eventually found was that, um, th that the, there are, um, that the rats form antibodies against something in the kidney. And what they ultimately found was that it's a protein called megalin, which is normally a, which is a proximal tubule protein, but rats also happen to express it um, in their, um, in their uh, podocytes as well. And so the, the antibodies develop these, and then the antibodies, um, when, you, when you do look at the histology, you can see these antibodies um, that they've actually bound to the podocytes. And so it's something about that process that, uh, that, that causes the, uh, the rats to develop proteinuria. And so because they now had this model, it really allowed us to be able to dissect a lot of what was going on what the mechanisms were of, uh, that, that were actually causing this membranous nephropathy. And, um, and so here, th this is now an example. So this is even zoomed in more than we had initially. You can see the glomerular basement membrane and all these proteins, collagens, and other things in here. You can see the, a little bit of the podocyte foot processes, and, uh, and you can see the, uh, the nephrin here. And here is, in, this is a rat, so they've got megalin on their, uh, on their podocyte foot processes. And you can see that, uh, that, that it's sitting on there on the basement surface. And this antibody that the rat has made comes in and now binds to the, um, to the surface of the, of the podocyte to the megalin. And that causes the recruitment of complements, including C5B9 complex, C5B to 9 complex, which inserts itself into the podocyte and then causes injury um, to that podocyte foot process. And so here are some of the things that we think are probably going on as a result of that. So here's now that C5B9 inserted into the podocyte foot process, and it causes all kinds of nasty stuff to happen to the foot process. Dissociation, cyto cytoskeletal changes, the cytoskeleton and its interaction with the proteins that, um, that, that cause the slit diaphragm to be intact are very important. Um, it activates COX-2 and causes ER stress, activates proteases, NEPH oxidase, um, all sorts of different pathways leading to injury of the, um, of the podocyte foot process. So that's sort of where we stood in 2002. Um, we knew that um, we had this animal model of, um, of, of uh, what looked very similar to membranous nephropathy when we looked at it. It's got um, IgG in it, it has um, electron microscopy, it's got these deposits. So it really looks a lot like, um, like human membranous nephropathy. And we knew that in this case, it was, it was megalin that was causing it, and it that C5B9 was uh, involved. Um, we knew that other things could be detected in, um, in subepithelial deposits, and they were, they were associated with uh, membranous nephropathy, but we didn't have any evidence at that point that they really did cause it. And like I said, megalin's not expressed in human glomeruli, so this is a rat model, but it definitely isn't what's going on with humans. So, um, so what really are the mechanisms? And, um, and then at that point, we had um, an interesting case report that kind of shed a little bit more light on this. So this was a child, uh, an infant, that was born um, with proteinuria and, um, and was, uh, had decreased urine output. Born at 38 weeks, um, the mother was 24 years old, um, had had a previous miscarriage. Um, and if you look over here on the right side of the screen, you can see that there was, um, at, at birth, there was really fairly large amounts of proteinuria, 22 days even, uh, a ratio of 28.3 grams. 
And then it gradually declined um, over time. And when they did a biopsy, they, they saw that there was, there was IgG in the, um, in the uh, lining the glomerular basement membranes and also C3. So, um, the, but they, they didn't know what was the cause of this. And so they did a number of pretty interesting studies looking at, um, at, at, at trying to figure out what this was. And so these uh, slides up here are all from, um, from a, a human kidney that they stained with, um, with antibody from the, from the mother. So, the, um, uh, so, so this is serum from the mother at, from pre-pregnancy. And pre-pregnancy, she didn't appear to have an antibody that stained. But here at full term, when they took her serum and, um, and, and blotted it with a, with a kidney, you can see that there's a lot of IgG in her serum that binds to the, um, to the glomerulus. And same thing when they took serum from the infant at 13 days old, it bound there. But at 40, let's see, I've got something blocking this, 40 days, it's, it's really not there anymore. Um, and so they, they speculated that this might be neprilysin. I, I think they knew that this woman had a neprilysin um, deficiency. And so they, they looked to see at, at um, and I forget exactly what these are, but uh, uh, one of these is rabbit kidney and one is human kidney. And so basically they, they looked to see if, this, if there was an antibody in the serum um, against neprilysin. So they, they blotted just with anti-neprilysin, and then they blotted with, uh, sorry, they blotted with, yeah, with an antibody against neprilysin, and then they blotted with a mother's serum and, uh, and, and showed the same thing. Control serum didn't show it, um, and they did a number of other studies, and ultimately they showed that this was an antibody against neprilysin. And so here are, um, let's see, there we go. Here are um, some other immunofluorescences. So, so now this is the child's kidney. When they blot with IgG, you see the staining. When they blot with an anti-neprilysin antibody, they see it. And it's uh, green here and red here. And, uh, and the merge shows that it's yellow. So that shows that they're really overlapping. And, um, and in contrast, the father's serum um, it didn't show that. So, so this is actually rabbit kidney. I guess they ran out of the, the child's kidney to, to blot. So, but, but basically, yeah. rabbit kidney shows the same thing. But when they blot with the, with the uh, father's serum, it didn't show that. So this is a neonatal membranous nephropathy. And they also showed that they could take the IgG fractions from the mother at the time that she delivered and, um, and when they injected it into rabbits, it caused the rabbits to have proteinuria as well. And it turns out the mother was genetically deficient in neprilysin, and she was probably immunized during her first pregnancy, that miscarriage that she had. And so then when the second child came along, um, she had an antibody, and that's what caused this neonatal membranous nephropathy. So this was the first time we actually saw the demonstration of an antibody to a specific antigen that caused membranous nephropathy. And, um, but, but again, this doesn't really seem like it, it should be something that accounts for membranous nephropathy. So that's sort of where we were um, in 2009. And um, this is a really cool part of the story here. So, so we, we, we knew that there were animal models that could cause um, membranous, that cause something that looked like membranous nephropathy. We'd seen that in some, some, you know, a single case report of patients, and there were others as well, of this anti-neprilysin antibody um, could cause membranous nephropathy. But we really didn't know what the cause of membranous nephropathy in general was. And uh, so I, I want to point out the author list on this New England Journal paper um, that the first author was Larry Beck. But Dave Powell, Tim Cummins, John Klein, all uh, uh, University of Louisville um, uh, people, and, uh, and played a really important role in this discovery. So we, we, we were looking for, for where, what was going on and, um, with this, and we, we needed to identify what this antigen was, because then we could potentially use it to see when people are going to recur, to track how they're doing, uh, maybe for prognosis. 
And, uh, and so that's what this study was looking to do. And um, so, so this is um, an, an example of sort of the, the basic way that, that this was done. So they took human glomeruli and, um, and sieved the, and, and crushed it up and then sieved it through various sizes of filters. And so what they were looking to get was the glomeruli. They, they started with the kidney, but they wanted to get just glomerular proteins out. And interestingly, this actually is uh, not the set of sieves that, the, that they used. This is something that I bought to, there's a, a state park here in Arkansas called the Crater of Diamonds State Park. And you can actually go and sieve soil for diamonds there. Pe people find like three carat diamonds and stuff. And so that's, uh, that's what this sieve set is, but I thought I'd throw that in there. And so then you can take those glomeruli and run them out on a gel. So, so this is a gel. You run the glomeruli out on the gel. And so all of the proteins are in here, but you want to find out what, um, what there are antibodies against. So in, in human serum, you want to find out what there are antibodies against. And so you can do that um, with a Western blot. And so this is a Western blot. You've, the, the, there would be, um, if, if you stain for total protein, you'd see there's a whole bunch of proteins in here. And then you can incubate that blot with human serum, which has got antibodies in it. And if there's antibodies against specific proteins, they're going to bind to those. And then you get a second antibody, which is, uh, recognizes the anti-human serum. And so any place that the serum has got an antibody that's bound to it, you'll see that there is a, is a secondary antibody against that. And so this is from their paper where they, um, where they looked at this. And sure enough, they found that in, in patients with membranous nephropathy, there was a band that they, um, re that they could see on the gel at 185 kilodaltons, but it wasn't present in these other glomerular diseases that they looked at, FSGS, diabetic nephropathy. Um, and they did, then they did some other things. They showed that when they did a, um, when, when they stripped the, um, uh, the glycoproteins, it changed molecular weight. Um, and then they looked at a whole, at a whole series of patients with, um, with membranous nephropathy. Um, so, and I haven't gotten into primary versus secondary, um, but so, so they looked at it where they basically secondary were ones that they knew where there's a cause. And then they looked at the idiopathic ones and that they found when they looked at a bunch of those that about 70% of the patients had antibodies against this, um, uh, this 185 kilodalton protein, whereas nobody in the group that had secondary membranous, other kidney diseases or normal um, had these antibodies. So it looked like they might be onto something. So, so then they took these, um, these bands that they identified these, uh, on these gels and cut them out and did proteomic analysis on it and found 18 candidate proteins. And so here's a list of them. It's probably kind of hard to see, but, uh, but, but this is a list of the proteins. So, so there's a whole bunch of these and, um, and, and they found these. And interestingly, they found this protein M-type phospholipase A2 receptor and also interesting at the time, they, they also found this other one, thrombospondin type 1 domain containing protein 7A, um, as well as a bunch of other proteins. And so then they did Western blots for um, all of these different proteins to see if they looked like they lined up with the, uh, with the, with the molecular weight of the, the same blots as the membranous serum. And you can see that there's some variability here, but there's nothing with the, of these there, there's not really nothing that's kind of looks like it's exactly the same weight as this first one, um, which is the, the blot of the membranous nephropathy. But what they did find is that, um, that uh, phospholipase A2 receptor antibody, uh, or that the phospholipase A2 receptor did line up pretty well, um, did, the, uh, did the same thing when they, um, uh, when, when they stripped it, and looked like a pretty good candidate. And here it is, here, this, this blot, this, these stains here show that you can, um, you can stain the glomeruli with, uh, with an antibody against PLA2R and it lights up. And then when you, when you incubate the protein PLA2R with it, you can see that all that staining goes away. 
Um, you can do two-color imaging for a protein that's in the glomerular basement membrane like agrin along with PLA2R and the, um, and the orange is where those things overlap. Here it is, is again blocked with PLA2R and this is a zoom in of that. And here's the PLA2R protein um, kind of sticking out of the, um, of, the, uh, of the membrane here. So these studies then demonstrated that antibodies against PLA2R associated with likely cause, it could, is likely the cause of membranous nephropathy and showed that it's present in about 70%. So, so we went from really not knowing what um, any of these idiopathic primary membranous nephropathies were to realizing that there's 70% of them that are, um, that are present in um, in, in, uh, in the, in pri uh, that, that have antibodies against PLA2R. And, but unfortunately, um, PLA2R is not expressed in the glomeruli of small animals. So they, 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 there wasn't really, it, it was, we still had some pro problems with um, figuring out mechanisms just because of the problems with animal models. Um, and so this is just to show you a technique called laser capture microscopy. So here you've got a, um, a, a image of a glomerulus in the kidney, and you can actually cut out these, um, these uh, glomeruli with a laser and get them to fall into a capsule and, uh, and isolate them that way. So th this is a way that you can sort of narrow down if you're gonna look at the, um, at the uh, just, just proteins in the glomerulus. And so I want to tell you a little bit about um, something. I think I may have some of my slides sort of in a funny order here. But anyway, I, I want to tell you a little bit about um, uh, uh, some studies that we did to, to first of all see if there were proteins that if, if we could potentially identify some proteins in a similar way but using um, microscopy of um, uh, laser capture microscopy to cut out the glomeruli, and then looked at, and then looked to see if there were increases of these proteins. And so I should tell you, so this was a collaboration with um, with the uh, 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 Arcana Laboratories. So Arcana is a nephropathology group that actually is located here in uh, in Little Rock and. Actually, the, the chance to collaborate with these guys was a big part of the reason that I moved here to Little Rock. Um, and they read about 17,000 kidney biopsies a year. Um, the second closest place in the country is the Mayo Clinic in Rochester who reads about 4,000 kidney biopsies a year. Um, and as it also turns out, we've got a really pretty nice um, proteomics core here um, with all of these Orbitrap instruments. I don't think you can go anyplace else now and see this, this kind of array of, um, of Orbitrap instruments. And so um, we have regular meetings with the people at Arcana. And so I was talking with um, Chris Larson, who's sort of the lead pathologist there now and, and one of the major, he is the major researcher there. And he said, you know, I bet there's increased in PLA2R um, in the glomeruli of these patients. And so to put it in context, what, what, we, what I think I and I think a lot of people thought was that there wasn't really an increase in PLA2R, but for some reason there was an unfolding of the protein that made it accessible to, the, to these antibodies. And so that's what caused the disease, that the disease was actually you know, maybe not a, an original problem with having antibodies against PLA2R, but the original problem was something was happening at the level of the glomerulus. The protein was kind of unfolding, exposing new antigens that, that, uh, that antibodies then developed against. And the reason that we could see it when we stained the, um, the, the, the uh, kidney tissue was that, that it, was, it was unfolded, not that it was more. So we did the experiment to find out. So just, just for the record, I was wrong and, uh, and Chris was right as, as he usually is. So this is a volcano plot where we had done um, the, uh, the uh, compared the protein abundance in glomeruli from uh, patients with PLA2R positive membranes. So they've got this phospholipase A2 receptor antibody and um, compared to patients that didn't have that based on staining. And so, and the volcano plot 
plots the fold change um, between the uh, between the groups um, and also the p value and these are both on uh, on log scales actually this one is not on a log scale but sure enough we found that pla2r um, was was the the protein that was sort of the outlier in this group that was statistically different and and much greater um, higher abundance um, and we did the same thing with another um, uh, known membranous antigen thsd7a and um, and and sure enough it, in those patients it it uh, also there actually really was more protein and that it wasn't just unfolded. Um, and so, uh, so then just a little bit of backtracking here. So PLA2R now is really widely used. Assays are commercially available. You can stain for it in tissue. You can, um, you can look for antibodies. You can follow it to see if the, if, what the patient is doing. And, uh, and maybe there, there may even be some cases, this is a little debatable, but um, where you, if you've got a positive PLA2R antibody, you may not need to do a biopsy in the patient. Um, and then just a little bit about this second protein, um, THSD7A. Um, so it was also discovered by the same group, inclu including your uh, University of Louisville um, folks also involved in this, um, basically using sort of the same sort of techniques. Um, this turns out to be about 3% of idiopathic membranous. Um, interestingly, it can be associated with malignancy. So if you see this, this protein, um, uh, is is in membranous. You have to worry about um, if the patient may have a, a malignancy. Um, uh, in in one case series, 20% had a malignancy that was identified within three months. Um, and then uh, THSD7A can, antibodies can resolve after su success, successful treatment of the of malignancy. And now this one, there actually are mouse models for. Um, and this just shows that antibodies, that, that these antibody levels um, can go up and down um, based on, uh, on treatment. And that you can see, see the, um, the antibodies that it can recur in a, in a renal transplant. And, and this is showing that we actually have it in, uh, in mice as well. So unlike PLA2R, um, THSD7A is also present in mice, so we can really use it to be able to identify, um, uh, to, to, to sort of start to look for some of the, um, the manifestations of, uh, of, uh, of the mechanisms of, um, of membranous nephropathy. I think I'm just going to skip over a couple of these here. So. So this is kind of what we know at this point. Um, we, we know that there, um, we, we know a number, for, even back from the Heyman nephritis studies, we know a number of the downstream um, events. We know that there's a role for some antigens. Um, but, but really, so, so what causes the membranous nephropathy in these patients with idiopathic me uh, membranous in patients that don't have antibodies against PLA2R and thrombospondin uh, seven domain containing uh, uh, protein. And, um, and what about lupus? We really don't know much at all about um, lupus membranous. Um, is there an increase in, in these endogenous proteins? I sort of got to that. And then what is the, um, what's the originating event? And so this is kind of the, the newer um, era of, um, of uh, membranous nephropathy. Now, using the approach that we described with this laser capture, we, and also in particular the group at Mayo Clinic, um, uh, led by Sethi and his colleagues, um, have used laser capture microscopy to, to identify um, additional antigens. So basically in sort of the same way. So th this is from, um, it's actually no longer in press, but this is uh, from Sethi's paper where they show, again, here's the glomerulus. Um, here's where they cut it out. Um, they identified an, a number of different proteins. Um, here's uh, phospholipase uh, uh, A2 receptor. But they also identified this protein. So this was sort of the next protein to be identified, NEL1. And, uh, and here you can sta see that they're staining for NEL1 in the, along the glomerular basement membrane. It, uh, they're staining in sort of a similar pattern for IgG, and these are the zoom-ins of the, 
down here. These are the zoom ins, and then um, and then you can see that it's yellow uh, or uh, yellowish green, and that uh, that shows you that these things are overlapped. So NEL1 then is another um, antigen that's present in membranous nephropathy. Um, it's found in about 16% of the PLA2R negative biopsies. So remember that PLA2R positive is about 70%. So this is a, a, of that remaining 30%, um, this is about 16% of those. Um, and this antigen also may be associated with cancer. And then I just want to show you a little bit about something that we did. So in a disease um, which is also a membranous nephropathy, but it's a membranous with masked um, uh, antigens. And so for some reason, when you do the uh, immunofluorescence like you usually do on a frozen section, um, in this disease, the, um, the IgG doesn't show up on the, on the biopsy. And, but then you can, you can unmask it uh, with, with digestive treatments of the, um, of, uh, actually you, you do this with the formal and fixed sections. You can unmask it, and when you do that, then all of a sudden the IgG kappa shows up. So other than the fact that the, the um, immunoglobulin staining is masked, this looks like other types of membranous nephropathy. And so um, because they've got so many samples at Arcana, we had a, a bunch of these that we were able to look at. And, um, and so we looked at glomeruli um, from 14 cases with this disease, membranous glomerulopathy with mast IgG kappa deposits, and eight other, um, eight other things. And this, um, this is an old slide. This, this is actually turns out to be serum amyloid precursor this protein which was the outlier here. And uh, that's from the proteomic analysis of these laser-captured glomeruli. And, um, and when we did that, this is again the serum um, amyloid precursor. You can see that it stains in, uh, along the glomerular basement membranes. IgG also does. The merge gives you this orangish color, so, uh, so it shows that, the, um, that there is actually a, um, uh, uh, an overlap there. And uh, so we've, we've identified this, and actually um, we and others now have identified um, a, a bunch of different antigens, and I, I think it's an expanding group. And hopefully over the next several years we'll have really a pretty complete idea of what all of these um, antibodies are that are causing uh, primary membranous nephropathy. And, uh, and, and hopefully that will lead us to be able to better diagnose, prognose, figure out what the associated things are, you know, which of these could be potentially associated, malignancy, and so on. So in summary, um, the membranous nephropathy is caused by circulating antibodies against antigen that are either in or near the podocyte. In most, most cases, they're on the podocyte, um, but not always. Um, Animal models have been important in understanding the pathogenesis, and um, it's, it does involve complement activation and probably is largely ca caused by this C5B to 9, to B, C5B to 9 complex. Um, anti antibodies against PLA2R are responsible for the majority of primary membranous nephropathy, and, but there's another of emerging a number of emerging antigens also that, uh, that appear to be causative of it, and the field is really expanding pretty rapidly. And I'll end again with this, uh, with this word cloud, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, uh, some of these words will make, uh, mean a little bit more to you. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, John. I think uh, John's talk did a number of things for us today. First of all, it was one of the best uh, dives into pathology on the kidney and uh, basically how to read a, a slide and look at the structures of the kidney to determine what's going on. So uh, congratulations on that, John. The second thing, as you can see from John's uh, passion, is that science and research is all about curiosity and finding what you're passionate about. Um, and obviously for John, he's very passionate about this subject. And the third thing, uh, as I'd like to thank John for is re uh, recognizing the large contribution that the investigators here at the University of Louisville 
have provided in this area. Um, we're, you know, as from what John says, we're a leader in, in one of these areas. And um, uh, I think the people here at the University of Louisville uh, need to hear that. And thank you for doing that, John. So my first question is, we've got all of this. You've got this patient. What are you going to do with them with this information? Yeah, so, so in terms of knowing what the, what the, um, what the antibodies are that are present. Um, so the, um, the, the biggest thing right now is sort of, so in particular for PLA2R, I think. So, so first of all, I mentioned there's kind of a debate about, um, about whether or not we even need to do biopsies in people. So, so what if you have somebody that's got 13 grams of proteinuria, a creatinine that's normal, um, and you go ahead, in addition to doing all the usual stuff that you do when somebody's got uh, uh, what appears, what they have nephrotic syndrome and you're trying to figure it out. So, you know, you're looking for all the secondary things, you're looking for HIV, the hepatitis, you know, you're wondering what the complements are. Why not just measure a PLA2R antibody or any of these other antibodies and figure out that they've got membranous nephropathy and maybe even avoid a biopsy. Um, and, and that's actually been the subject of debates at our national meetings and other things, and there's, there's arguments for and against it on, on both sides. And I, I think for the most part, people aren't really there yet. But we, we might get there to that point where you just don't even need to do a kidney biopsy. You can just say, well, I know they've got membranous, I know they've got PLA2R membranous, and I'm gonna treat them as if I had the, had the biopsy to, to prove it. So that's one thing. Another thing is following the titers over time. So, um, you know, the, the, and it turns out, I, I didn't go over this, but the titers of PLA2R antibodies tend to precede what happens with the clinical findings. So the PLA2A PLA uh, antibody will start to go down before the proteinuria really makes a, sig a significant change in treatment. So that can give you an idea, you know, you might be thinking, do I need to move on to a different kind of treatment? Um, what should I do? If you see that the antibody titers are going down early, then you can say, oh, I really am being successful. The underlying disease looks like it's being, um, being taken care of, and I just have to be patient to wait for the proteinuria to go down. And then the other thing is recurrence. So you can you could potentially follow that along over time and see if the PLA2R antibody goes up, and that that will probably precede the clinical findings. So you could potentially treat early, maybe prevent some of the damage that would have been done if you hadn't treated early. Um, so so there's really a lot of things that you can do with these. So uh, this really is the first step for personalized medicine in nephrology where we have this information to help guide what we're going to do. Ted Dryden, a uh, gastroenterologist out at the VA, uh, asks the question, I'm really curious about the C5 BPLA 2R combination and initiator of immunogenicity. Where does this come into, con into contact with antigen presenting cells? So I, as, as I understand it, and I'm not an immunologist, um, but as I understand it, so what really happening is happening is that um, when the antibody is bound to its antigen, so that's, that's the first step, that the antibody, so if, for instance, PLA2R antibody binds to the, um, to, the, uh, to the antigen, and then that brings complement in and activates the whole complement cascade of which the c 5 b to 9 complex is, uh, is one of the terminal things that's activated, and that ends up getting inserted into it. The, the problem with that is that IgG4, which so most of these um, membranous nephropathies are IgG4, is the, the subtype of immunoglobulin, and it's really not all that good at activating complements. So th that's actually something that's always kind of bothered me a little bit about what we know about the pathophysiology. But, uh, but th that, that's, I think, sort of the general understanding of what's happening. Okay, so I don't see Ted typing any questions right now. Um, there are no other in the chat boxes. Uh, I 
So there's somebody live, so go ahead. Hi, it's it's Doncaster. You knew I was going to ask a question. Of course. Uh, I, w I would have been disappointed if you hadn't. So excellent talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a great just overview of the history and 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 the accomplishments of, of decades of work culminating with this, you know, true biomarker that we are using in clinic every week. So, um, and I wanted to uh, let everyone know that this phospholipase A2 antibody is something easily ordered in clinic. Um, it's available in Epic, and it's it's a part of my regular practice. Um, so. Um, and and I, I would be happy to have to see this as part of a workup before a patient comes to me. So <laughs> so the residents feel free to order this um, as a part of routine workup for nephrotic syndrome. Um, I have a question about you know this issue of primary versus secondary um, because I think you know with PLA two R um, it you know it, it kind of brings question to some of the things we thought were secondary. And maybe we should say associated with um, an example I have is sarcoidosis. So I have a, a handful of patients that have PLA2R positive membranous and sarcoidosis, um, but the two don't seem to necessarily, uh, you know, if you control the sarcoidosis could be under good control, but they still can have an exacerbation of their membranous, where you know sarcoidosis, for example was uh, thought to be a potential cause of secondary membranous. Um, I know that Larson and his group, you know, had published a paper looking at these, you know, secondary causes. And sarcoid, interestingly, about 70% of the patients were PLA2R positive. Um, so just throwing that out there is, you know, is this a way we can kind of tease out true secondary versus associated? Um, you know, what would you describe as a true secondary? In my in my mind, the secondary is where you fix the primary disease and then the secondary disease goes away. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, now that we are, are started getting at what some of these antibodies are, yeah, the, the distinction between primary and secondary is, is I, I think, a little blurred. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting point with the with the sarcoidosis. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, so so presumably then, if, I mean, is it just an overlap? So seventy percent of all idiopathic membranous is PLA two R, and seventy percent of sarcoidosis associated membranous is PLA two R. Yeah, I, I don't know. That that's uh, that's it raises some interesting questions, but I don't think I have any good answers. It, yeah, it, I think might, I, th it, I think the waters are a little muddy now uh, with with these new you know autoantibodies. Um, and it is interesting if is it you know associated versus secondary. Um, and then we have all seen patients with just increased autoimmunity that kind of collect these autoimmune diseases. <laughs> Yeah, and and what is it? The, so now we know what these antibodies are, but what is it that that causes these antibodies to be generated in the first place? So uh, John, Tad has a follow up question for you. He wants to know it, uh, if the immune pathology is actually coming from the complement activation. So I, that's, I think, the general understanding that the antibody is um, is fixed to its antigen, and then that recruits complement in, and that's what causes the damage. Um, actually, Don, I'd be interested to get your take on this. So if if IgG4 doesn't fix complement very well, why do we see all this disease? I mean, I I I, I, I think Tad, I, I think that's the general understanding, but I'm not sure it's right. Yeah, so it, it's still a little bit of a mystery. I think um, the lectin binding pathway has been implicated, and a lot of people. I I personally am not studying this, so I don't want to, um, you know, make any false claims. But you know, I know in the the lectin binding pathway um, is implicated uh, in membranous, and and there are actual clinical trials going on looking at. Uh, drugs that target this pathway. Um, it's also been looked at, there have been 
some, so at the recent annual meeting ASN, um, some other models that have been looked at um, are this glomer glomerulus on a chip model, um, where you can actually look at uh, pil A2R mediated disease on a, it's, it's really neat. So if you look up glomerulus on a chip um, and, and that group uh, that is studying that, which I think is out of USC, um, has actually looked at complement mediators um, in that model. So we might, you know, elucidate more information based on that. All right, seeing no other questions, I'm going to uh, bring this to conclusion with some lovely parting gifts. I believe this is true, if Jason <laughs> will, will check in here. What you'll receive yeah. today, John, for participating will be a lovely Louisville Slugger bat commemorating today's talk that you can display in your office and use on your fellows at will. So uh, Tad does have another question. Uh, then the glomerulus is like a sieve catching the garbage, non-specifically activating complement in the space between the basement membrane, perhaps. Well, I, I don't know if I would say that because in the absence of an antibody, um, then we don't see this. So, so you have to have the antibody present. And, and so, so somehow that must be involved. And, and so, I mean, I, I still kind of like the hypothesis. It, it's, uh, I, I like simple things, and this is a simple thing, sim simple way for me to think about it. The antibody gets stuck to the antigen, complement gets stuck to the antibody, and, uh, and, and that's what causes the, the injury. Gar hey, garbage being the antibodies is, is his follow up to that first comment. So. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it, there, yeah. If there's if there, there's all kinds of examples um, of of so for instance um, it, some different types I didn't go into. Um, so babies that are fed cow's milk um, can get antibodies against bovine albumin. The bovine albumin can get stuck in the um, in the uh, at the level of the glomerular basement membrane and the podocyte, and then these antibodies can come in there and activate it, and so that can cause um, membranous nephropathy also in infants that are fed cow's milk. Um, uh, uh, hepatitis B um, the, pr probably is preformed antigen antibody complexes that form in the plasma get filtered and then get stuck there. So in that case, definitely, that's, that's garbage being deposited there and, uh, and, and activating complement and, um, and, and, and causing injury. So multiple sort of different ways that, that it can happen, but all of them involve antibodies, at least in the case of membranous. Right, Ted says uh, thank you for the interpreting and that he is <laughs> finished with questions at this point. If you wanna follow up with John, uh, I think his uh, email is on there. If it's not, go ahead and uh, email uh, Don Caster because she loves talking to people. So um, <laughs> thanks once again, John, and this concludes our session. But like I said, you should be receiving a Louisville Slugger, slugger bat. If Jason, if I'm wrong, please let me know. But No, uh, you're correct. You're <laughs> very good. All right. You are correct. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, Dr. Arthur, and thank you, Dr. Breyer, for uh, for everything today. And uh, and we will have one more grand rounds next week uh, prior to the holiday, and it will be it is will be pulmonary. And uh, our guest will be Abhishek Singla from the from the University of Cincinnati, who will be talking about uh, ILD, interstitial lung disease, and uh, that'll be next week, 8 a.m. next Thursday. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Arthur, and thank you, Dr. Breyer, and thank you everybody who joined us, and uh, we'll, we'll see you all next week. All right, thanks everybody. All right, thanks, thank John. Thanks, guys, we'll see you. Bye. Bye.